We're going to be exploring a number of aspects to do with Ukraine. Um, but let's begin with John Speller to kick us off. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair. And I think a number of the uh, military have, uh, have said that uh, before the start of hostilities that they think, thought that they'd overestimated, in, in hindsight, they'd overestimated the Russian army and certainly underestimated uh, Ukraine. And um, many commentators fully expected it wouldn't be possible for Ukraine to resist what on paper appeared to be an overwhelming Russian military advantage. What, in your view, is the key factors that have prevented Russia from making gains over the last year? Yeah. Yeah. Ed? So I think one of the main things for me, I mean, it's very difficult to single out one area where Russian poor military performance has been uh, key um, because it has been so comprehensive across all sort of military functions. I think really you know, political through to strategic operational and tactical objectives have not aligned on the Russian side at all, whereas on the Ukrainian side they align perfectly. The political objective is to get all Russians out of Ukraine and that can translate to military objectives on the tactical uh, level. So I think that's really key. And then not to go too heavy on military doctrine, but in terms of um, fighting power, the conceptual, um, physical and moral components, it's been the moral components, so leadership, um, ethical foundation and morale, which has really been the difference between the two sides. And that where that is an area where Ukraine has been in the ascendancy and Russia is completely deficient in the moral components of fighting power. You mentioned the morale uh, issue, one that many um, uh, generals in history have said as, as being the key component of, uh, of, of conflict. What's your assessment now of morale within the Ukrainian for forces and the Russian forces, given that both of them have been taking significant losses? Yes, and back to your first question, I think the other thing on the morale component that it's very difficult to measure, and that is perhaps why there is an overestimation of Russian capabilities and an underestimation of Ukrainian uh, capabilities. Uh, in terms of morale, I mean, from the Russian side as well, they did not start at sort of 100%. It's not like a computer game. Um, a lot of the force were, had been uh, deployed on the border for you know, since April the previous year, um, and also quite austere conditions over the winter before they stepped over the line of departure. So Russian morale was not in a good place at the very start. And then when the, you know, the special military operations, sort of three-day operations started to fail, it went further downhill. And there has been nothing apart from sort of maybe last summer where they managed to get some territorial gains in the east, but very slowly at a very high cost. They're really the only um, objectives that they achieved militarily on the ground, which would raise morale. And at the moment, I just can't see anything that is... Uh, realistic um, Russian military objective on the ground that will do anything to do that. And morale is infectious, both if it's low and high, whereas on the Ukrainian side, they have had multiple um, battlefield successes and morale stays relatively high uh, across the board because that's what they're prepared to do. And also as the fighting season uh, starts again, you know, they, again, they are very much in step with their political um, level of warfare because they know exactly the job that they need to do and they have the capabilities to uh, attempt to do it. Fighting season almost gets us back to medieval warfare, doesn't, that, doesn't it? Andre? Yes, uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for supporting Ukraine all, uh, for, during the whole this year. I'm happy to, if you don't mind, I would start with the first question because it's, uh, it's something which we're also studying a lot. Uh, so what, what exactly happened and why? what are the under, underlying reasons for Russian bad performance and Ukraine better performance? Um, so first of all, obviously, we can see that Russians had problems uh, all the way through throughout the whole, um, each, each element of the, uh, of the capability. They had problems with doctrine, they had problems with leadership, they had problems with the, uh, with the state of their, um, of their weapons and uh, and basically this is oh, I mean they have made an enormous amount of uh, mistakes from the very beginning, particularly uh, from the very beginning. When I mean is that they they started that war with the with the forces inadequate for the for completion of the uh, of those pl operational plans which they had, 
And uh, then when they started it, they uh, expected this to be very easy. So the, lots of the troops were moving in a, for example, as an example, lots of the troops were moving in a in a sort of logistical transport mode rather than the assault mode. Basically, they were they 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 miscalculated the whole the whole campaign from the very start. Question: Why that all happened? I mean, there are some deep underlying reasons, um, you know, in in this which gets us to studying like like the internal organizational issues within the uh, Russian armed forces, which led to those mistakes, because those mistakes are systemic. And to my, um, it's sort of hypothesis, but uh, more probably provable, that uh, we believe that the key reason is that uh, they don't have any, for, for years, for decades, they didn't have any external control over their armed forces. Basically, no, obviously, no democratic control, no civilian control, but no other control whatsoever. So basically, armed forces were developing as a thing in its own, uh, without the, any challenging, and basically they uh, uh, un, being unchallenged for decades, they 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 basically were rotting from inside, and that's what what we believe is uh, there to stay, and that's why we believe that it's not going to be fixed in a short period of time, uh, and that's what why the commander is returning, for example, uh, back to the positions uh, after they've been fired, they, as you know probably what I'm talking about, uh, and uh, I think that this this will be with the Russian army. For some long time that's why our our forecast is that they will continue making lots of mistakes in the future and um, generally will underperform uh that that uh, produces morale so uh that produces low morale because they clearly see that their their plans are not working uh we saw lots of their um, internal letters uh, text messages uh, whatever else uh, they clearly expected this to be a few day campaign uh then it didn't work out uh, that severely hit morale and right now um, as you probably could see, the, uh, any little progresses which they have are more attributed to the mercenary groups rather than the, rather than the, uh, the regular armed forces. Regular armed forces got stuck, and uh, they feel that, they understand that. Th that, that essentially makes morale very, very difficult. Uh, for Ukraine, Ukraine expects a counteroffensive. Ukraine has been extremely motivated, um, first of all, because we don't have any other chance. I mean, we don't have any plan B. We need to defend our homes. So that gives a, a huge motivation, of course. But also we've been motivated with the fact that uh, we were doing better, much better than expected. And we we did uh, massive breakthroughs in, uh, in certain parts of the front. So we know that Russians can be beaten uh, and that we knew from the very beginning, but also reinforced in uh, during the autumn um, counteroffensives. So right now we, we we know this can be done. We know that exactly how to do that. We just need tools for that, and uh, it will be done. So that produces our morale. Thank you. You mentioned the mercenary forces, the Wagner Group. The, the history of mercenaries has been that when things go badly, they tend to fade away. Why is their morale holding up? Uh, they have a very difficult, they're very, very different uh, culture, so to speak, com uh, completely. So they are, uh, most of them, especially currently, are either highly paid mercenaries which stay away in a rather relatively safe place and uh, directing the other groups, the, the main like uh, assault groups. And then they have a lot of the, uh, a lot of the people who basically uh, have a certain attitude to life, and basically, for most of them, uh, uh, they they accepted the the the, the thing that, that there's an extremely high chance that they're not going to survive. Uh, as NATO just recently, NATO intelligence just recently reported, which been reported by CNN yesterday, their losses in Bakhmut, for example, is five times higher than than Ukrainian, which is astonishing number even for us. We we didn't. I I personally was was shocked by that. Okay. So uh, so that's the uh, that's the morale of uh, people who basically not so much holding uh, for anything and uh, um, but 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 the question is that that cannot be scaled all, all the way across the armed forces and basically scaled on a on a substantial number so I would look at this as a more niche uh, organization with the uh, with the uh, very different but very limited uh, uh, potential okay thank you very much all right John thank you We've got two supplementaries on this Kevin and then uh, Robert Thanks. Can, can I just pick up in terms of uh, the Wagner Group and obviously Edmond <clears throat> comment as well? I mean, if you look at, for example, the New York Times, I think it was yesterday or today, I mean, there's quite strong statements being made by Projolian in terms of suggesting that uh, his groups are being uh, 
starved of ammunition, etc. There clearly is a lot of politics going on between yes. him and the Chiefs of the General Staff, Grasimov and others. Um, what's your thoughts? What's actually going on? Is it blame culture or is it what? It's a question to me, yes? Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, to our opinion, the uh, situation is this. So first of all, Prigozhin is extremely ambitious and very aggressive person, generally, and he obviously is attempting to convert his success into political success, even limited success. Um, and uh, basically, he is uh, trying to uh, to uh, use that, and uh, and he obviously f is uh, advertising himself and his group extremely, uh, and uh, he's criticizing armed forces. Uh, there is there is a lot of things to criticize them for because they are underperforming and they're underperforming in logistics and they depend on the armed forces on supplying of weapons, etc. But we know that there is a rivalry between the groups and, and in Russia, it's a typical Soviet uh, uh, story, uh, which it continues in modern day Russia. Uh, it's a rivalry between the uh, def uh, between the uniform services. So they have a rivalry between FSB and uh, army. They have a rivalry between police and FSB and army, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So obviously there is a rivalry between the uh, Wagner and uh, and the armed forces. And since he is actively pushing uh, agenda of firing some generals, basically interfering in a sort of um, decision making. Uh, on, uh, on particular generals uh, was extremely aggressive against some of them. Uh, so essentially he tried to interfere in the in the overall command. And as I just said, army is a thing in its own. It's a self-preserving mechanism in Russia, which is extremely, uh, has a close knit and a very tight culture. With decades, they found a way to coexist with one each other. And clearly they don't want uh, anyone from outside to interfere, uh, particularly publicly. And so they rejecting uh, him, uh, and as byproduct, they reject the uh, his group and and, and their and their uh, their operations. So yes, they are under supplying them uh, consciously. They don't want them to scale. They don't want them to 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 grow bigger than they are. Um, that's an internal internal struggle, which we obviously all look uh, with a great interest at. Um, I believe that uh, they will it will continue. So uh, perhaps it will damage. Damage their results, uh, but uh, that's, that's what we have. I would like to see Prigozhin falling out of a window sometime soon. Uh, no, I wouldn't be too surprised if right. that happens. Okay, um, Robert. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I wanted to ask about one particular aspect of what uh, would, in theory, have been Russian military advantage but doesn't seem to have um, borne fruit, which is um, aviation. Uh, so on the face of it, there's a mass uh, of uh, approximately 10 times uh, of Russia over Ukraine, uh, and uh, to say nothing of an apparent technological advantage that, again, doesn't seem to have uh, borne fruit. And could I just ask uh, both Ed and then Andre in turn what they feel is, this, is the answer to this mystery? There clearly is an aspect of, of uh, Russian uh, uh, military aviation doctrine that's lacking of combined uh, control. Um, but there also seems to be an element of it just having been held back and not deployed. So it's a bit of a mystery because it's one big factor that you would have thought they would have used more. And I'd like to get to the bottom of that. Ed, can I go to Ed first, please? Yes. And in terms of the superiority of, superiority of numbers, you're correct. Um, I think couple of factors that I'd highlight is that <coughs> in Russian military doctrine I mean, and, and practice and culture that land forces have their sort of priority. So yeah. in terms of the command and control, land forces had the priority and they struggled, um, especially with communication and sort of marrying up the land and uh, components. Um, also made more difficult by um, electronic warfare fatricide. So effectively, um, air operations were not fully integrated. Um, with land operations. They don't have a doctrine of combined air operations in the way that we do, do we? Is Not right? in the way that we do, no. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I think there's an element of the weakness in their targeting cycles and prioritisation as well, uh, and how the um, Air Force went about the campaign. So they did identify certain targets, a lot of the fixed targets that they... Um, had to strike. I mean, you know, they, they fired the missiles at, but they didn't necessarily do the battlefield damage assessment. So they just assumed, well, if we've shot at it, it's it's therefore destroyed, which was not certainly the case. And mm -hmm. then also a lot of the um, assets that they were to target were mobile, and the Ukrainians knew that they had to disperse their assets to keep them alive. Um, so 
in the first couple of days of the operation, we saw a lot of um, air activity, but then that just sort of leveled off over the last, or the first couple of days. And then a wider point on Russian military, which has really dogged their operations, is that they don't come plan. So once plan A had sort of failed, they were not there already with sort of a plan B, plan C fleshed out, which in NATO militaries do as a course of um, their planning. So effectively, when plan A failed, they just didn't back up plan B. Could I just before I go to Andre, could I just press on one point? So I, I gave you a premise there, which, I just, which is: is it military failure, or is it that they are reserving that uh, air force for future operations? I think it's military failure. Thank not, you. They're not. They're not specifically trying to preserve their air force, or they were. They were not at that time. They, you know, in a war like this, you have to, t- you know, take certain operational losses and. Um, to achieve your objectives, but I think it was the fact that okay. once they tried to achieve their objectives in the last in the first couple of days, they just without a comm plan, the air force didn't really know what to do and how to best support land operations. Okay, we are going to have to make some progress. Andre, anything to add quickly to that? Or uh, no, to be honest, that gave an extremely comprehensive answer. I, I completely agree. I just want to say that uh, uh, when they are not challenged, they're using air force in full. For example, we saw Mariupol, which was a city completely destroyed by the air force. Uh, because they were safe, they were like 20 minutes, um, basically 10 minutes to fly, and nobody was challenging them there, and they just leveled the city down. They would do this with any other city if they weren't challenged. Yeah. So, so it's only about uh, them being denied okay. that opportunity. Let's Thank com- you. go to some comparators here. Sarah, do you want to take us forward? Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, if you permit, Andre, can I just pick up on morale? You're on the ground there. What's the morale uh, and support for the offensive of the Russian people, particularly now partial mobilisation has been put in place in Russia with significant loss? Well, I'm based in Ukraine and uh, obviously we don't, uh, it's not that I'm on the ground, uh, you know, understanding exactly what happens with Russian people, but we do have some some specialists which are looking into the uh, Russian society um, on a sort of daily basis. I have to say that these are mixed. So um, there are different different parts of the Russian society reacting to the war differently. So the most uh, sort of intelligent uh, and uh, let's say pro West, not even pro Western, but more pro democratic, so to speak, so, uh, part of society, they are um, they are uh, shocked, obviously, and they've been shocked for a while. Lots of them have left. Etc. But they're not a decisive factor. Uh, they're not making any decisions, and they're not influencing decisions. So, so essentially, they they they've been ignored. And as you know, uh, Russian government is not restricting anyone to leave. To, so they're very welcome to go, uh, which many of them did. Uh, at the same time, there is like um, uh, a, a larger part of the Russian society which are quite complacent. So some of them support. Uh, uh, the war, some of them don't, but uh, they're not like really into the uh, uh, any active movements or any active even expression of their feelings. And a lot of them are are just uh, accepting it. Um, it's very difficult to say like about the proportions because any polls in the totalitarian state are very extremely uh, they cannot reflect properly the the the, the situation. Uh, so so we don't believe in polls, but polls are certainly showing that a majority. Of Russians uh, supporting uh, supporting war, certainly a, a large part of, of them do. Concerning the um, mobilization, as we can see, the mobilization was normally done among the, um, let's say, uh, uh, we, with a, with a, with the parts of society with less income, uh, and uh, they were uh, lots of them just accepted it and very quickly accepted it, and uh, we saw people like villages basically gathering and sending their men to the war without any understanding what this is for, how, like, what's going to happen, and so on. Uh, then they were complaining for lack of training and equipment, but but that didn't change anything, really. So uh, we do know that they're continuing mobilization, not that uh, publicly, uh, but they're still hiring and uh, recruiting recruiting people, um, like on a sort of like a low level, low intensity, ongoing basis. And uh, at the moment, that doesn't change much in the society, in the overall societal like uh, attitude to the war. They're very careful, it seems like, not to go to the situation like it has been in uh, Soviet Union with Afghanistan, which is, was extremely unpopular and contributed to the um, demise of the of the of the Soviet Union uh, regime. And obviously, like uh, anything like World War One, when they had total mobilization, and it failed. 
and the war failed, and then the people returned and no was okay. the regime. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's nothing like that at the moment. Okay, thank you. So we're entering year two, relative deadlock. Um, how do you compare the capabilities, war fighting capabilities, and the mass between the two sides, Ed? Um, firstly, I mean, I think it is an important point. It's year nine. Um, it's just, you know, this is the second year of war. Um, military operations have significantly increased and, uh, you know, the frontage at the moment is about 1,200 kilometres. Um, and that's quite important just in terms of understanding sort of the military laydown. And I think back to one of my previous answers, I mean, yes, numbers are important and Andre covered sort of the mobilisation on the Russian side. And we understand about the losses that the Russians and, and Ukrainians to slightly lesser extent have um, taken over the first year. But this is all about sustainment and how long each side can go. So it's all about how, you know, firstly over the winter that both sides have recovered for spring offensives, but this also could drag on for a number of years. I agree with Andre's assessment that um, there are systemic issues with the Russian force and you know, if it was one or two issues, if it had been an intelligence failure, the plan had been bad or the operational um, execution of that plan had been bad, there'd be something to sort of focus on fix. But this is just pretty fundamental um, in terms of the Russian side. And also, I think Russia has less options. We've seen operational tempo increase. Uh, in terms of the inputs from the Russian side over the last four weeks, but we haven't seen any operational outputs. They are still making very slow progress in certain areas which are just not really um, that important to the, to the wider campaign. And actually, I think Russia has very few options for this potential spring offensive and, uh, from the Russian side, and I'm actually unconvinced that they'll be able to achieve that and turn a military objective into a political objective. We'll come on to the spring offensive in, in detail in, mm -hmm. in a bit with Kevin, Kevin Jones. Can I just qu quickly pick up on tanks? The use and provision of tanks has been mm -hmm. described as transformative. The numbers are, are quite low for Ukraine, 2,500 compared to 12,500-ish. Uh, for Russia. So Ukraine wanted 300. They've got 100. Um, how is this going to change? How are they going to get the tanks there? How, when are they going to get the tanks there? How many will actually arrive there? And how will it transform the battlefield? So on <laughs> tanks, I think you know, the first point is I think the West were quite slow to provide tanks. I think the decisions that we saw in January should have been made last October to give them a time to be integrated and onboarded so they'd be ready for a potential spring offensive. So in terms of when, you know, because each nation are providing, you know, a certain package of tanks to add up to just sort of 100 plus on probably initial tranche, there might be more. Um, Ukraine are going to get them in a sort of piecemeal fashion, and it really depends how Ukraine wants to use those tanks. I think the 300 number was from Ukrainian defence planners. That would have been ideal, but they, you know, they will take which tanks they have. You know, there is superiority of Western tanks over Russian tanks, and it depends whether they want to invest them straight into the fight now, either in the east or the south, or they want to take you know, keep them back and actually train them collectively at a higher echelon to sort of give them that offensive power later on in the year. So it's all probably about timing. Again, we'll probably explore this in more detail, the tank Sorry. question. Andre, do you have any quick comments before we move on? I fully agree. We've been talking uh, about tanks for, for a long time. And the fact that uh, if, <clears> if something is, is complex as tanks is supplied, uh, you know, in the winter time for spring, it's, it's, a, it's a quite late, particularly since it's an extremely difficult piece of equipment with lots of sustainment, uh, you know, issues to uh, to support it with, etc. So, yeah, um, we, 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 we will certainly do our best and certainly any any chance to speed up the delivery would help. Uh, but um, uh, comparing to the howitzers, like self-propelled howitzers, which we've been receiving and the other uh, pieces of heavy equipment, it indeed comes in a piecemeal fashion and uh, that's uh, that's a little bit inconvenient. But um, yeah, we'll do what we, what we have. Thank you, Sarah. We're going to move away now uh, from uh, the sort of Russian capabilities or, or thinking prior to the war and look to the West. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask a question about the FSB and perhaps the hierarchy in which these agencies, the, the, these big mass groupings, uh, operate uh, in, in Russia. We, you, know, you have these big names, uh, Bortnikov, uh, Grasmikov, uh, um, the uh, Shoigu, uh, Lavrov, Peskov, 
All these characters have worked around uh, Putin for many, many years. Many of them are somehow connected to the FSB. Is it right in saying that he didn't trust the military to command the invasion and therefore replaced some of the senior personnel with FSB uh, leaders, uh, battalion commanders and so forth? Is there any truth in that? And that's one of the reasons why the initial invasion stalled, because you had those in command and control were actually not familiar with the, the, the military environment. Yeah. Um, um, uh, from, from our Andre. knowledge, uh, most of the military planning was still done by military, but uh, that war had to, uh, had to have a, a large pre-military sort of preparation stage and a very significant uh, element which was uh, related to, um, to sort of sabotage operations uh, which were supposed to support the military invasion. So basically military were only involved in a pure like movement of the troops and uh, the certain ground was supposed to be prepared before that and that has failed uh, as well. So uh, um, I, I'm not aware of the actual FSB commanders actually running the battalions like military battalions. Uh, that would be very unusual because indeed these two organizations are not collaborating usually uh, between themselves and they're not sharing the um, you know capabilities etc uh but uh, uh, but it was supposed to be that they were collaborating it was supposed to be that one helps each other and that collaboration didn't work which is not again is not surprising us because they always had rivalry but uh, that indeed was um, one of the key uh problems for russians from the very beginning of the campaign uh, Ed, anything to add? Yes, yeah, I mean, FSB, they certainly, from an intelligence part, they sort of led on the intelligence preparation of the battlefield ahead, and they did have a probably an outsize uh, role in the planning of the operation, which was then partly handed over to the military. Uh, I don't think that they were in necessarily like moving FSB into positions of command, but Soviet and then Russian structures also have sort of FSB embeds <coughs> sort of widely placed through, throughout the military. Um, and I think it was partly the assumptions, the false assumptions that Putin had about the fact that Ukraine would, you know, would not fight uh, in the way that they did, which was partly through the assessment of the uh, FSB. And also, I think that's started to change now, especially with the Fifth Directorate, which in the FSB does sort of foreign interference, that they got it so catastrophically wrong that I think sort of okay. that priority order has, has started to change. Talking of getting it so catastrophically wrong, Kevin Jones on our committee prior to the invasion was saying, the Russians are not 10 feet tall, I think was the phrase that you used. In other words, you know, we should not assume that they're going to be this uh, new modernized armed forces with new doctrines and protocols that's going to be able to invade in, in the way that perhaps we're all frightened of. And yet the CIA, the American president even, was planning, made the assumption that Kiev would be overrun, offering President Zelensky a helicopter ride out. How did, was it the case that even uh, Western and senior Western intelligence you know, sources and services assume, made the assumption that Russia had this capability, which clearly they didn't. Well, I think in, in terms of available data, which we knew that the Russians underperformed in uh, Georgia in 2008 and went through a period of modernization. What appears to be the case is now is that modernization sort of really did kick off in the first four years. But then when Shoyu came in in 2012, it sort of petered out in terms of the, the ambition um, there's a lot of immeasurables, like I said, moral components, but also graft in Russian culture uh, was significant. We assessed it as a certain sort of percentage. It might have been double or, tri or triple that, and that had a real issue. Uh, the other operations that they had done in so Donbass since 2014, Syria, which was primarily an air campaign and then supported by lower levels of infantry, um, and then other operations uh, conducted by Wagner in, in Africa, yeah. they were all much smaller scale. And when Russia does the large scale exercises, ZAP had sort of 30 to 50,000 and tr you know, does combined arms maneuver, those exercises are highly scripted, partly because they also, you know, they have to invite NATO um, observers. So they kind of, I think they believe their own hype in terms of the system, and we did as well, because it's actually very difficult to assess how any military would do <coughs> the, you know, this scale of operation is unprecedented, certainly in the last sort of 
I think there was an assumption that both Donbass, prior uh, Crimea, and indeed Syria were almost like the Germans in in Spain, you know, prior to the the, <coughs> the, the Second World War, is almost like a training ground for them to <coughs> explore new uh, capabilities. And su- just and successes there, and especially in Donbass and other places, led them to move to a, the battalion tactical group structure, right. which was wholly inadequate because it's not how they train. So they basically went and fought with a different structure to how they train, and that caused a lot of the issues. Okay. Andre, any quick thoughts? Yes, very quickly. Uh, I agree, uh, but also, we, we, from what I've seen uh, talking to some US analysts uh, during that period of time, is that they mostly concentrated on the on numbers. So, like, numbers of planes, numbers of tanks, number of people, etc. And uh, basically comparing numbers, of course, uh, that, that was that, uh, you know, the Russians had an advantage. And also they did not understand how different uh, Ukrainian and Russian armies began, became over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, since the, for particularly since 2014, when the war in Donbass started, Ukrainian army had changed dramatically in the approaches, etc. Okay. Lots of people uh, considered this as a more like a soft subject. And they couldn't 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 easily be evaluated, so that it didn't feature in evaluations, and um, and that that led them to the wrong conclusions. I do believe that there is now uh, some effort to understand why those wrong conclusions have been made. Um, so we'll we'll see. So yeah. some big lessons to be learned. Well, let's now talk, focus on who's controlling the agenda the best. Uh, Emma. Thanks, Chair. Um, Andre, I was just wondering if we can explore how the delivery of Western military support has shaped the conflict so far, and in particular, how well that's been coordinated between Ukraine and donor nations. And I'm particularly interested in the timeframes between when equipment and support is agreed to when it's actually then delivered. Is there a significant gap between that? Um, thank you. Yes. So first of all, on a just a general level, uh, it obviously the supplies from the West shaped uh, extremely because uh, Ukraine was running out of the ammunition, running out of weapons uh, quite soon, and so by the by 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 May, we already needed a substantial influx of the of weapons, and uh, as you know, they've been delayed at that time. So they started only arrive in June, July, and became became actually combat ready in June, and that gap was the most difficult gap in the history of our country. So May, for example, May in the beginning of June was the extremely tough, uh, tough period. Uh, but luckily then the Western weapons started to arrive and uh, took the place in the battlefield. And yes, they had shown that they are working very well. Uh, I spoke to, uh, I don't even know how many soldiers which are actually working on them personally. And uh, in vast majority, they actually like, they, they like them a lot. I mean, they're more sort of user friendly in a way uh, they're better performing they so 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 there is a very positive attitude to what the uh, allies do now in the terms of logistics of course it's a huge challenge so we're talking about tens of different types of uh, of uh, similar weapons um if coming from all different countries uh, all requiring different parts all requiring different training of the mechanics uh, sometimes they are coming very often they come as used and uh, very often uh, there is a, a certain lack of the um, of the documentation, like uh, how to support it and so on. So of course these all the issues are being resolved, but that's that provides some additional challenge to the logisticians. Uh, but and and the, and the, and the mechanics supporting like technical support. Um, but uh, now, now the the question between the like a political commitment and actual physical delivery. Yes, indeed, in certain cases the countries are. Uh, are kind of slower. Uh, in some cases, they're extremely fast. So I've seen, for example, the announcement made in one day, and then the actual howitzers arriving in a, within a week. So um, after the announcement, so so sometimes it's really fast. So it all depends on the country. It all depends on Ministry of Defense. It all depends on the negotiations. Everything is handled by Ukraine in a in a very uh, intense personal communication between the MODs, Ministries of Defense. Uh, I know that's uh, like a lot of people are devoted to that, a minister particularly. Um, they're doing, I, I believe, a great job, and uh, they 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 they're following each of those of, of that supply individually. <laughs> Basically, it's like a a little project each of that, and so each project has different performance, different results, and so on. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Ed, did you want to add anything to that? Just that I think we've seen the provision um, improve. 
over the year, um, you know, starting from the sort of first UK hosted donor conference, which is then formalised into the Ukraine um, Defence Contact Group, which I think it's on its eighth iteration, which was on the 20th of January, when the tank provision was one of the most important uh, parts. Um, we have seen an improvement. There's still issues that need to be addressed to look at what Ukraine's future requirements are. Um, I also think it's highlighted the importance of standardization of military equipment mm -hmm. uh, across Europe and also defense industrial <coughs> uh, capacity, which are really important. And then the only other point is, I mean, you know, you have to also understand the US leadership in this, uh, both in terms of the, the amount, the sheer amount that the US um, have donated, but also in the leadership and sort of being quite collective around sort of meeting those requirements and critically also US logistics as an enabler. The US were able to move things from mainland US into Ukraine faster than some European nations. And although we do a lot of work in sort of... Why, why, why was that, Ed? Because they invest in it. They invest heavily in their logistics uh, because they need to um, for a variety of reasons. And we're just not up to scratch in that regard. I mean, we, you know, there's a lot on sort of military mobility, increasing logistics, but ultimately it's quite fragmented and very difficult. And I hope that there's a bit of a political driver to sort of address those issues now, because moving equipment um, from west to east very quickly is obviously a key defence requirement for NATO going forwards. Thanks both. Thanks. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Thanks very much indeed. Um, let's move over to the, the air domain. Um, Robert. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of light to uh, pick up there. And um, perhaps you could just hold the thoughts later on. We're going to come to uh, the uh, future and what we should be doing. But you've mentioned logistics uh, and the ability of moving equipment from one place to another. And I'd be, when we look at our own capabilities, I wonder if you'd comment in due course about the loss of C-130 and what that does to air mobility capability. Yeah. I'll leave that for the chairman to come back to later, though, if I may. Um, for now, what I'd just like to pick up on is the um, point that you've made about future Future Ukrainian requirements. Now, of course, and again, you just mentioned that the uh, provision of tanks was the last big ticket request, as it were, and challenges seen as, un having, as having unlocked Leopard 2. The big ticket request now, of course, is for uh, jets. And that, of course, isn't a response that uh, something's been responded to in terms um, by the West at the moment, although, of course, last couple of days the Americans have got a couple of Ukrainian pilots that they're training on F 16 Sims out in Tucson. Is this something you think is likely to change, and can it? And do we not in any event need to talk about which jets? Yes, and I think you're right that sort of provision of military technical assistance to Ukraine has become highly political. Um, and also there's obviously a lot of focus on who might sort of initially um, donate and then sort of to try and trigger yeah. other donations in kind because no, no country apart from really the US has the, the amount of airframes that they could provide. Um, to, m to make a real difference. But I think specifically on air power, there's almost two things. I mean, there's one which is support to combat operations, say, this year and next year, which actually I think is perhaps less important for Ukraine at the moment in terms of directly supporting ground combat operations from the air. But this is an element of it's a long-term transition for Ukraine um, because at some point... You know, the shooting will stop in this phase of the war. It might go to a period of negotiation. The shooting might start again. But what is critical is that the U Ukraine can re-establish deterrence over Russia and then defence. And to do that, they're going to need, um, you know, more modern equipment. So I think back to my previous answer in terms of sort of current and future as well, I, s I see the air domain sort of more on those future requirements. And actually, I think it would be a useful opportunity now for NATO, similarly how NATO has sort of allied command operations for the current fight and allied um, command transformation sort of for the future fight. That's where we sort of almost need to divest these questions and look for long-term support. And I think it's a very sort of boring programmatic view of those future requirements of us looking at our own kit and capabilities across all nations, looking to see when um, capabilities are going offline and starting to sort of building up those <coughs> future packages, because that's ultimately what Ukraine will need going forward. Yes, and the standardisation point you made a moment ago is um, pertinent there as well, isn't it, across Ukraine? Absolutely. And I think, again, on air power... Across NATO, it, sorry. Yeah. It's less about the technical specifications of the aircraft themselves. It's all about the maintenance, and you know the maintenance requirements are going to be more challenging for Ukraine than the actual airframes themselves. 
Yes, uh, although, I mean, the reason I was asking that question is we've heard, uh, of course, F-16 is the one that everybody talks about largely because a lot of them, they're relatively cheap in uh, relatively cheap and easy in the scheme of things. Uh, we, of course, have Tranche 1 Typhoons, which are really getting obsolescent air-to-air only, very long runway needed, long um, uh, logistics tail. Um, we don't hear much said about Gripen, which strikes me as being the obvious aircraft for this theatre. Yes, um Ukraine my, you know, my, my colleagues who are absolute air power experts, I mean, they have identified the Gripen as the, again, from a technical perspective, that would be the one that is of most value to the Ukrainians at the moment because of the ability for maintenance, um, also to be able to use short runways, which means it can disperse, um, which other airframes uh, cannot at the moment. Um, but like I said, I mean, I think where the, you know, the battle currently is that Ukraine would take any aircraft that we were able to provide, they're not necessarily going to be picky. But back to my point on sort of the long-term transition, I see mm. it as inevitable. So it's good practice to start the training now, mm. and then obviously when they are potentially um, you know, invested or deployed, that that's a separate question. So if you you're very keen to point out about the short-term, medium-term, long-term, these are different questions. If I'm without they are, but, but again, my point is, it's almost inevitable that Ukraine sure. at some point in the future will get these jets. So if that is the case and you do see it as inevitable, then I think the training is right to start as early as possible. And so, thank you very much, Nate. Andre, would you, could I... Uh, go on, yeah. Can I just say yeah. Andre and then Mark will come? Uh, yes, I agree about technical platforms and I do agree that we'll be happy to, to work with any platform which comes earlier because, to be honest, I mean, for us, it's uh, it's not a, a matter of the like a long... Uh, long prospective future we would rather start like as soon as because for a number of reasons so first of all they do uh, the jets would would play a very practical role even now i mean they would play a role particularly with their defense and uh, and uh, and and perhaps some other combined operations so so that we we have uh, constant calls from our military that uh, the jets are a part of like the you know much more advanced uh, you know uh, campaign plan and if we had them we would have a much better chances so uh, so so also at like a separation of the uh, our near plans and then the future plans shouldn't be like that defined you know we would rather see this as a transition from one to the other because uh, first of all uh, we, it's very difficult to calculate exact end game of this phase uh, how exactly it's going to end and whether it's going to end or whether it will transition into some kind of a, a, a other form of conflict, maybe not that intense. And uh, it's difficult to predict uh, because it's still shaping up, because it's still forming and it, we would rather we would rather influence shaping this up rather than trying to sit and wait until until the first phase ends so we can start to work on another phase. Also, the complete uh, the, the first phase depends on our readiness for the for the for the future uh, enduring strengths. Particularly, if Russians see that we are uh, preparing for the long game, if we are already setting up um, such uh, complex systems such as Patriots, for example, which we do already, such as fighter jets, and uh, so we are we are preparing for the for the very strong um, you know enduring strengths of Ukraine in the long term. They would certainly understand that uh, they because right now it's i mean again it's a hypothesis but it's pro probably valid one they want to outweigh uh, the west so they want to play the resources game in the terms of that they have more money they have more people than in ukraine they have more equipment and and they ex and they expect <clears throat> perhaps that the the western support will be somehow diminishing or or exhausting or, the, or will run out of the weapons or ammunition etc um, we need to prove that different, and we need to we need to build up like already now for the for the for the longer future. Okay. Um, so that's I believe it's important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Robert. Uh, Mark, Ed, can I start with you? Can, can I make a can I make an analogy with tanks? Mm -hmm. So, yes. so <clears throat> you're now talking about up to 200 leopards for the Ukraine, some various donor nations. You know, if you're going to form a you know a powerful armored brigade. It, it helps if you've got mainly one tank. But when we gave Challenger 14 Challengers, that in a sense was as much a political as a military decision. And after months of agonizing among NATO nations and others, when we leant forward and gave the Challengers, that politically, as it were, broke the dam. 
So if you use that analogy with aircraft, most of what the Ukrainians use are ex-Soviet aircraft. That's what they're trained on and experienced at maintaining. What they want are more MiGs, for instance, the Polish MiG-29s, and other lighter aircraft like F-16s and potentially Gripen. Typhoon, if we give that, is a more complex aircraft and more difficult to maintain. But politically, if we were to donate, say, half a dozen Typhoons... We haven't got them. If you make... We do, actually. We do. Yeah. No, we do... Kevin. In theory. No, no, no. Let's we, just go in theory. Let's look, keep going. So if we were, well, I'll come back to that tomorrow, mate. If we come, if we were to donate half a half squadron of typhoons politically to break the logjam, would there not be benefit from that, even if militarily they might be difficult to operate? Yes. Um, the only sort of caveat to that, that I don't think the provision of Challenger 2 necessarily broke the dam on the tanks debate. Um, that's what the objective was. Mm -hmm. But actually, the German government still effectively had to lobby the US to agree to send M1s mm -hmm. at some point in future in time. So yes, but we did go first. Yeah, yes, we did go first. And I think it grew pressure on the Germans, but I don't think it necessarily broke the dam. On fighters, I think, yes, as a political, um, you know, there is value politically in suggesting that we would um, provide typhoons in whatever numbers to then have other nations then also contribute. But back to my earlier point, I see the provision of these, uh, you know, typhoon to Ukraine as inevitable. It just might not be in the next for example, a couple of years. So I think there's step one is to start doing the training so that it becomes a realistic future option. I mean, to, you, to use a popular phrase, politically, you could look at it as a sprat to catch a mackerel, if you, if you see what I mean. So, so, so Andre, what did, Andre, we, we had President Zelensky address Parliament in Westminster Hall extremely powerfully. Yep. And he asked for jets. He was very clear. He even gave the Speaker a, you know, a kind of fighter pilot's helmet which he may need for Prime Minister's questions at some point. But, but from a Ukrainian perspective, if the UK could donate some typhoons, does that help you? And if so, why? Yes, absolutely. It will help. It's absolutely, definitely uh, and clearly. Uh, why? Because we, indeed, there are two parts of that. One, military. And as soon as we receive the actually working planes with the trained pilots, with some uh, maintenance training and capability, uh, sooner than we can deploy them to frontline and they can make a, a massive difference. So that's a, mili a short military answer. And this is a common, con uh, common opinion of our uh, military experts. Air Force, um, uh, Joint Command, uh, very clear, even uh, spoken in behind, behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, politically, we we watched uh, the Challenger and basically a tank uh, tank story unfolding. Uh, I I I personally spoken to lots of uh, members of parliament and politicians and analysts in in, in Germany, and uh, I can say that at least to their experience. Uh, challengers uh, did made a massive uh, push for the Germans to uh, to agree on their on the on the, on the tanks. That wasn't immediate, uh, so it's not it wasn't automatic. Uh, it was difficult. They still needed to go through lots of decisions. There was still a lot of pressure, but that pressure. Uh, but but basically, challengers were detrimental for, for 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 those decisions and for that pressure at that point. So I believe that if we draw the analogy from there, I mean, I don't know if we can draw this like in a hundred hundred percent, but certainly that worked back then, and sure. um, and perhaps it will work with uh, with with fighter jets as well. So yeah, from okay. our side, <clears throat> encouragement. For All that. right, thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank Robert, you. did you want to come back? Yeah, very quickly, please, Andre, if, if I may. Could I just set aside the political question of what a typhoon donation would do, which I understand the point that Mark's making entirely around leveraging other things but uh, you know Andre you're just on the military use of them I'm just conscious that we're talking about an aircraft that requires a very long runway um, is highly complex and has a very long logistics and contractor tail with it at the same time and at the end of that has a very limited air-to-air -air only capability I mean is it <clears throat> that in useful militarily or would we not be better looking at what would be more suited further down the line 
I certainly, uh, technically, uh, what, what we would do uh, is to set up a, a, a joint, you know, UK-Ukraine working group of specialists on this, which would look at particular runways, which would look at particular bases, where it can be serviced and where how it can be uh, serviced, and that they, they would make the decision. I would certainly avoid making my own statements, you know, definite. From my perspective, yes, we can, we can work it out, we can work with this, but uh, certainly there's like probably thousands of technical questions to be answered uh, before the final we know it's final critical. decision. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. We, we did visit Wharton where they, they put these together and, and serviced them up in the northwest of England with BAE Systems. I did ask how long would it take to train a MiG fighter to transfer across to Typhoon, and they said a matter of months, So, which, yeah. is, which is quite interesting. And therefore, if we had them, hypothetically, and slid them across the table, probably would be more political than it would be providing military assistance. Mm. My question, if I may, to, to both is, yes, absolutely, there is a sense of urgency. Spring offensive, you want the tanks, you want the air power, I think, rather than jets itself, the uh, mm. air superiority. But you've got a real mixed bag of Haribos, haven't you, with so many platforms on so many levels. And this is long term, this is unsustainable. Would it not make sense for Ukraine to absolutely request what's in the cupboard now, but to lock down what type of tank you want long term, arguably the Leopard, what type of aircraft you want in the long term, arguably the F-16, to give clarity, recognising that there is political symbolism, which Britain could once again illustrate were it to slide across the typhoons. Ed, do you want to have a pop at that first? Yes, and I agree. I mean, I think the main thing that you know drives it is availability of either vehicles or airframes at the moment and the issue with availability is it's never what it is on paper so there's obviously a lot of analysis that you find that a lot <laughs> exactly but you know it, it makes it a little bit of a challenge that no one can actually you know pin down the exact number of these but like i said my, my position i mean just partly as a sort of aside i think also while these discussions are really important actually the more immediate needs of ukraine is on more simpler things like ammunition and shells etc so i think yeah. we can get distracted by talking about sort of more technical capabilities um but i do see this as something that long term ukraine will get all of these jets when they sort of go offline and sort of back to my earlier answer about sort of almost splitting this in half to the immediate fight and then longer, longer term. term okay we'll the, come to it, we'll come into detail of what that longer term might look like. Uh, Andre, any quick observations? Yes. Of course, uh, so using single platform for each or for each type of weapon would be uh, would be much more preferred. Standardization is a key. Uh, logistically, it's indeed very difficult. Uh, working with those logisticians almost on a daily basis, and it's uh, it's it's indeed tough. But it's workable. So it's not like uh, it's not like it, it cannot be um, it cannot be resolved. It's just it's it's just more, it's more difficult. Question only is like what is the trade off between time and inconvenience? So whether the time of receiving those available items is more important uh, than inconvenience, and I believe that time is more important. So I we, we, and that's why we never complained about having lots of weapons different times, but we did complain about the delays. Okay, thank you for that. Um, when we look at the number of countries that have actually uh, joined in in sanctions against Russia, it it amounts to only 34, and it's a reminder that there's a bigger picture taking place here. Um, I think that leads us in nicely to the other stakeholders. Uh, Richard, do you want to take us forward on this area? Yes, um, the, the rumours or speculation that China is cursing up to Russia, um, maybe with the aim of giving them weapons, uh, condemned by both Jen Stoltenberg and the US Secretary Antony Blinken, and obviously uh, by us. Uh, what are the military and political implications? Even six of them. Should China provide military assistance to Russia. Ed, can I come to you first? Yes, I think in terms of the political uh, consequences, I mean, it would be a highly escalatory move, and that has sort of already been communicated, um, as you uh, suggested, you know, not just in relations with the US, but also the relationships um, with Europe. Uh, at the moment, China has provided uh, non-lethal systems, you know, navigation tools, etc., dual use, uh, but they haven't thus far gone for what you know, Russia really needs, which we've already 
discussed a little bit about. Um, it would also potentially invite sanctions onto the Chinese companies that would um, be potentially supplying those. Um, and, you know, China does not want that and they probably do not want the, um, the focus. I think if they did, it would be a point of no return for China. Um, and also when... What if they gave weapons? If they gave weapons in any sort of, you know, for example, in a modest contribution... Point of no return, in what context? Diplomatic, politically, that right. they have sort of gone, you know, towards siding uh, with Russia. Um, they would then also not have any mediation role that they, you know, they, on the 24th of February this year, they drafted um, potential, which was just sort of dismissed. Um almost immediately, but that would not sort of go and, you know, what the EU and US have said in the last sort of week, that that, that would be a red line that would be crossed. I think the potential advantages, although I, they certainly don't outweigh the cons of this, would that it might f have to focus the US a bit more immediately within Europe and slightly away from the Indo-Pacific, but also they, they might need, or they might see it as an opportunity to test some of the their military equipment for the future and a lot of their military equipment that they have developed over the last couple of years um, has sort of been reverse engineered from things that they have been provided by by Russia so there's there's an element where they need to sort of perhaps test some of this equipment in a real operational environment. It was a very good article in the Spectator and I hope I paraphrased correctly where they were implying actually what the chairman has uh, hinted at a lot in recent months um, that China is, it could be an opportunity for China and Russia to change the world order by themselves becoming what they would see as the powerhouse in the West and the US in, in a, a league too. Do you think they'd ever grab this opportunity to try and adopt that position? Because that clearly is where they always want to be, number one, isn't it? But I, I think that where that option may have existed just over a year ago with the sort of the discussion about a no limits friendship. I think we now know that it certainly has limits. And I think the issue with potential support of military technical assistance to Russia is there's no guarantee that Russia would actually be able to use this equipment to have a decisive effect on the battlefield. I mean, they need, you know, um, you know, one, two, two, one, five, two millimeter shells, they have a real ammunition shortage, but they also still need the operational ability to use that ammunition to enable maneuver to take back territory to achieve a political objective. And at the moment, it's just not certain that, you know, while I think that military support, and again, it, it depends on the sort of the, the volume of that support, but there is no guarantee that Russia would actually be able to use that to translate into acceptable military objectives, which that could then be turned into political objectives. So there's a lot of risk for China. Um, you know, and especially in areas like the UN, you know, China have put a lot of soft power effort into sort of um, you know, certain committees in the UN, et cetera, sort of, you know, all of that would be at risk if they take this step. Okay, thank you. Andre, what's, what's your view? And I'm assuming that were China to use weapons, there'd be evidence of that on the battlefield very quickly, which you'd pick up, and there's no evidence of that right now, I take it? Yes, so at the moment there is no evidence. Uh, we would, of course, pick it up uh, through various sources even before it gets to the, to the, to the, to the battlefield. But certainly, when it gets, um, and the, the, of course, uh, well, we, we clearly see that Russian offensives had stalled, and basically they cannot move further. And as we just discussed, wherever they wherever they have a, some limited progress, that's even not their um, regular armed forces. So they do run out of weapons. They run out of the um, ammunition. They have problems of uh, with the industrial complex. So uh, in the resources game which they wanted to play, uh, they're not doing that well. And for sure, for them, the you know opening a Chinese support would be would be amazing, and uh, and and hence very very dangerous for us. Uh, at the same time, um, we highly doubt that uh, you know China really wants Russia to win, uh, because indeed if it wins, uh, it's uh, well first of all it won't win. It will just delay the war. For a long, long time, and it would make it even more bloody. And if it would make it, but 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 Russians are not able. They don't have enough capabilities. Even if they have an unlimited amount of weapons, even if they have an unlimited amount of the ammunition, it's still not enough to win this war. And China cannot w win it for them. 
So essentially, it's investing in something which is uh, which is extremely uh, damaging for Chinese reputation and uh, and providing no assurance of any result whatsoever. So uh, with the uh, with the approach which China tries to demonstrate and project to the global scene, like as a, as a, as a sort of a wise and sort of peace-seeking uh, nation, that certainly doesn't bring them any any results. So. Um, so that's why that's why it's a big question mark. To be honest, I mean, it's too early to say whether they're doing this or not. We'll certainly we'll see if they do. At the moment, it's still, I believe, in the decision making. Andre, forgive me. Your presence state. due to see your presence due to see the Chinese is he not? He hasn't Excuse done it. He's due to see the Chinese, isn't he? The president, your president. Uh, perhaps yes, but it's uh, yes, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't. No. When is that due to happen? Do you know? Uh, we, I can't comment on this. I I don't know. Okay, Chairman, thanks. But uh, just to pursue that a bit further, Andre, uh, Russia is uh, one of the few friends that China has. If China does lose, it would be significant for Putin. It would be significant for the direction of travel for Russia, and that would be significant for China. So China can't afford Russia to lose, or it would be very, very difficult given where China wants to go in the world. Um, and now let's look. Yeah, well, I mean, they cannot uh, perhaps for them it would be an un, you know undesirable effect if La Russia collapses uh, completely loses completely except that except that the uh, you know in this highly hypothetical scenario it's a question of how china may see it playing in the case if russia is collapsing uh, but again we are talking about a scenario which is um, you know one of many and we we don't know exactly uh, where we are at this point of time uh, with this scenario. But then the question is, like, what China can do about the global isolation of Russia, what they can do about the uh, the fact that it's just a matter of time when Putin and his team are convicted criminals in uh, many, uh, you know, very difficult uh, crimes like uh, terrorism, like, uh, you know, crimes against humanity, etc., war crimes, and so on. And uh, also, Russia cannot avoid... Uh, cannot avoid economic sanctions and they cannot avoid the reparations because they caused an in enormous damage to Ukraine, which is, again, just a matter of time when this damage goes back against Russia. And um, and so 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 China cannot save Russia from from its own problems, which they created because because they went too far. I believe that maybe in the beginning of the war, maybe in the first months, it was possible. But after cases such as Mariupol, when they destroyed half a million city completely, uh, I mean, this certain, there's certain, you know, lines which Russia crossed. Well, basically, no one can save them uh, uh, right now, to be honest. Okay, but Ed, uh, India and, and China are both still supporting, in one form or another, Russia. Uh, therefore, Russia is hoping for the long game. The purpose of China, surely coming in with its own deal, is actually to stall yep. uh, any... Uh, advance that uh, the Ukraine might be able to make to push Russia, Russia back. Yes, and that brings danger. Of course, they are, they are, they are not interested in Russia losing completely, and uh, indeed uh, they are not supporting the war, but they are certainly not condemning Russia like 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 our Western uh, nations do. So basically, uh, uh, we are, I believe, in the middle of uh, some point where some decisions will be made by Chinese. Okay. And w whatever can influence that point, of course, it would make sense to do right now. Ed, did you want to quickly come in and then to Derek? Just, I think in terms of support, I mean, there's, a, you know, apart from sort of military, overt military technical assistance to Russia at this point in time, they can do more on, for example, technology exchange. They can also do sort of dual use technology transfer to... You see that increasing? To, yeah, to yeah. alleviate sort of the sanctions that Russia has, because that, that is really a sort of limiting factor on Russia's ability to uh, regenerate some, yeah. some of its capabilities. So they can do that in a less overt way. But also, I mean, I think from a Chinese point, you know, keeping this war going at a certain level yeah. might have advantages because, you know, if the US are diverting their now scarce resources, especially on technical equipment, such as, for example, HIMARS ammunition, then they can't go the to useful distractions exactly okay. thank you very much let's turn our attention back to closer to home um derek uh, ed if we can go with you first obviously we hear a lot about nato unity uh, and the importance of that and given that everyone now believes this or most people believe this is going to be a long drawn out war uh, where would you in a sort of one to ten scale where would you put the level of nato unity at this point in time and do you think it's sort of it's got the resilience to stick in there. 
Um, so I think unity has changed slightly, and I, I think even without the war in Ukraine, you know, this was a pretty significant year. Or last year was a pretty significant year for NATO, anyway, with the fall of Kabul towards the end of 2021, and sort of expeditionary operations not going well for NATO at all. Um, the what's happened in the war since last year is it has enabled NATO to go back to its basics and its fundamentals of defence and deterrence of the Euro-Atlantic area and also escalation management, which they have been doing since the Washington Treaty was signed and it really is NATO's bread and butter. So I think part of the unity is due to the threat that Russia has posed and sort of external factors, but I also think it's internal factors because we were due to have uh, NATO's new strategic concept uh, in 2022 anyway. That said, what has happened uh, since the war and also coalescing around support to Ukraine is you've seen a very high degree of NATO unity, both in terms of the provision of support to Ukraine, but also member states um, incurring significant costs, you know, in terms of cost of living, etc., um, you know, price of commodities. Uh, and I see what's critical to that unity has been U.S. leadership since prior to the invasion when they shared um, intelligence suggesting that Russia was planning a large-scale uh, invasion of Ukraine and also what they have done in terms of unlocking all of the potential political blockers. I think Secretary of State Blinken has done a very, very important job of managing that and now we're starting to see these structures that are in slightly independent of NATO such as the Defence Contact Group which I believe has about 52 members so it's not just NATO. Um, so I think you know I'm pretty optimistic on unity and the other factor is that the EU and NATO I mean they've signed their third joint declaration earlier in this year which was delayed but there is far more synergies between NATO and the EU now um, than there was before the war I think they're also closer to sort of deconflicting um, their comparative advantages uh, that we have been for a long time. So actually, when you look more broadly across Europe, I don't think it's just NATO. It's sort of all other issues, you know, Joint Expeditionary Force, for example, which, again, high degree of unity. What we're seeing, um, I think, will be sustained, um, but it is also dependent on what happens on the ground in Ukraine. And the, you know, upcoming, it's not too far away now, the US elections, um, in terms of the future in the US position, because you've mentioned quite rightly how important the US is to all of this. Absolutely, and that is, uh, you know, it, it's a risk, and I, I imagine it's also a worry um, for a lot of European nations at the moment. I think we saw in the US with the, you know, how Senator McCarthy was elected as Speaker. There was, you know, reports around then that, you know, support long-term support to Ukraine was one of the the issues that they wanted to discuss. So, if there was a candidate that uh, got the presidency in 2024 that was less sympathetic to you know, Ukraine and you know, that could have a, an adverse effect. And this is where I think where NATO is also looking, you're seeing far more um, reports in the language of a sort of Europeanization of NATO as well and a recognition that really, you know, European nations have to step up now. Um, you know, it, it's not acceptable to continue to rely um, on US security assistance. Yeah. Andre, what's the, what's the view from Ukraine about... Um, the well, term, the long term originally, resilience. originally, of course, we were um, a little bit surprised with the lack of involvement of NATO in the, from the beginning of the war, and we understood that this was because of the uh, NATO as organization. Uh, while the NATO countries made a massive, huge involvement and uh, they helped with weapons, they set up Rammstein format and so on. Uh, NATO as a, as a headquarters organization was less involved and. Um, uh, and we we assumed that this was because they wanted to avoid the escalation and become the, sort of considered as a party to the to the war. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, when I spoke to a lot of um, government leaders and uh, some of the analysts uh, who were discussing the escalation scenarios, one of the escalation scenario was considered that you know the NATO would somehow be involved and uh, it would be what in US in the press called the World War Three, you know, with the multiple multiple participants from 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 different sides. I don't think this this the, the Putin is in at any stage of uh, really threatening NATO countries now. Uh, he obviously is barely coping with uh, with Ukrainian front. Uh, I think that this this scenario is like uh, not that much relevant. 
At the same time, we see a lot of involvement uh, from some point of time. It was um, uh, very significant work being done by NATO leadership in terms of the uh, advocacy and in terms of explaining the war to uh, all different audiences. Uh, I think Secretary General is doing a fantastic job in this because he he, he was leading lots of nations and lots of uh, opinion leaders and uh, societies through these uh, periods of the uh, war fatigue, which we had uh, particularly in summertime and then in the autumn and then and, uh, and so on. So, and uh, and then NATO became more involved in different other like particular aspects. Uh, so I think that um, at the moment, that's what we see. It's difficult for us to estimate this is a ideal version of collaboration or, or not. But uh, I think Ukraine and NATO has, a, has obviously a common future. There is absolutely no doubt about that. We uh, we certainly probably would become a, a, a very strong partner for NATO for the for the for the for the for the nearby future and uh, would be a very contrib seriously contributing member to NATO um, in the in the future. And I believe that we need to just to to, to keep on collaborating, to keep on communicating, and uh, and that's uh, and and uh, partnering on whatever whatever the different programs. I think that's the way forward. So far, the framework of the collabor of the part of the support is established, uh, like with Ramstein format and with other working groups. I don't think it would make sense to change it. Uh, but um, yeah, NATO can play obviously a great part in this. Okay, thank you, Chair. Derek, thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> can I ask uh, what the impact? Uh, we've already touched on it really in terms of the. I think you referred Ed to the fighting season, but there's clearly a spring thaw coming. Um, and it's just interesting to know what uh, is going to happen in the conflict in the coming months in terms of what the major developments will be. Can I ask Ed first, then I'll come to... Um, so I think in terms of <clears throat> talking about fighters seizing, fighting seasons and the weather, yes, there's an impact of military equipment such as vehicle movements and radio batteries etc they run down in cold weather etc but i think the most important part of this is that your war is a human activity and it's fighters on both sides that have been in pretty terrible conditions on both sides throughout the war so it's not necessarily just when the ground enables maneuvering vehicles as well but it's also about preparing um, the troops again to sort of get out of pre-prepared defensive positions and potentially go on the offensive the current uh, balance on the ground at the moment is that Russia currently holds around 17% um, of Ukrainian territory, up from 7%, which they had in 2014, and went to a maximum of around 30% um, towards the end of March and have lost about 50% of their gains. The point there is that the military balance on the ground suits neither side. We know that Ukraine is very clear that they want that 17% to be zero. Uh, from a Russian side, we're not entirely sure what they want. They want it to increase from 17%, but also you have to look at the ground and see what are those potential military objectives. And think back to the morale point. I mean, Ukraine have been pretty, um, you know, not, not necessarily telegraphed what they're going to do, but they have options, which is the assess, um, you know, essence of making strategy. And they, I think, have a very clear idea of how they need to go about military operations on the ground. I think it's very much less clear from the Russian side. Um, and also from, you know, I've seen a very much a reduction in quality of Russian soldiers over this mobilization period. We now hesitate to even some of the footage that I've seen call um, you know, Russian fighters infantry in some regards. For me, speaking as an ex infantry I think you need certain sort of basic yeah, yeah. infantry skills, you know, no movement without fire, pairs, fire and maneuver, which I just don't see the Russians doing at the moment. So to move from defensive operations to offensive operations, combined arms maneuver at scale, I'm very skeptical that the Russians are able to do that. I should ask on that. In terms of the what you still, still see it, is the Russians, as you say, are still deploying armour without infantry or very limited infantry. Is that because they haven't got it or is it just a... Uh, uh, Sorry, they just don't know how to deliver infantry and armour at the same time. Um, 
So I, I think it's a bit of both. Um, I mean, the you know there's a 1,200 mile current front line of around 820 of that is currently contested. Um, that's a lot, and they ju I just don't think they you know in terms of the breadth. And this is an issue that we've seen with the Russian operations. They are not coordinated. You know, in terms of designating a main effort and making sure that they have the ammunition and logistics support to offensives. Which again, I just. I'm seeing not much evidence that they are doing that. I mean, you know, earlier to your question, also in terms of we've got to remember that it's, you know, Russian regulars, Wagner and other um, mercenary groups and also militia units. You know, unity of command, one of the principles of warfare just does not exist. And the Russians have been really poor, specifically in the east. In the south, they, they were better at, um, at that. So as the time comes and, you know, the conditions allow for more offensive manoeuvre. I'm very sceptical that the Russians are able to sort of mass in the quantities needed to make a breakthrough, whereas on the Ukrainian side, I, I am pretty optimistic, mainly because of the counteroffensive in Kharkiv um, in September last year. I mean, it was intelligence-led, it was well-planned, they probed the line and you know got lucky where they sort of uh, enabled a break in the lines and they exploited it very very quickly um, they had the confidence as well to set um, a limit of exploitation not get too carried away I mean all of those points to um, you know operational art which if the Ukrainians have that you know provided they have the capabilities then I think um, they have the advantage ask us in terms of also in terms of clearly the a lot of the fighting is going on in the Donbass and other areas, and there's a indication that around Kershon and other other areas, other fronts, they've basically built large defensive uh, positions in terms of uh, the Russians' position. Is that is it simplistic to say one's defensive and the other one's, from the Russians' point of view, offensive? Or at the moment, I mean, both sides have probably you know been both on the defensive over the winter because it also allows a period of recuperation and also specifically to start to stockpile ammunition and put it to where it's needed for for when offensive operations resume. Um, where the balance of power is on the ground at the moment, again, I mean, you mentioned Kherson. I mean, you know, the Russians have also shown that they struggle with river crossings of smaller scale water features. The ability to go further west, um, I, you know, west of the Dnieper, I think is absolutely... Uh, off the cards for the Russians at the moment and also they they also need to protect the territory that they currently have I mean one of their operational objectives was to get a land bridge from Russia proper to Crimea which they currently hold at the moment but they need to hold that because if that is put under threat the whole position in Crimea gets under threat so the, I think the problem the defensive in the south they're trying offensives in the east but for all of the reasons that I've outlined they are effectively misfiring and they just can't coordinate and designate a main effort to go forward um, first of all I agree with uh, with everything Ed said and uh, I would just add that uh, indeed uh, Russians would be trying to to make an offensive operation in the, in the east uh, they planned for it for a long time. Uh, it didn't work out so far. Uh, I don't think they have any political decision to cancel it completely. So I think that would be still trying. Uh, we expected it some time ago. Uh, clearly saw that they were not prepared. The capability they didn't amass that necessary capability for it. And uh, uh, but uh, but but for them it's a it's a it's a critical political matter to show at least some results. Uh, I, we commonly believe that uh, the results with, with the, the sort of an interim goal which they put in, uh, in front of themselves would be uh, occupy uh, Donetsk uh, uh, region completely, which they would call a liberation of Donbass and would highly advertise it and so on. So that, that was their plan. That plan clearly doesn't work out. I don't think it's going to be successful. I think that we have enough forces there to, to make it fail. But we haven't seen any other plan so far. So I think that that would be the only one. Uh, and then, to, 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 theoretically, if they are successful, they planned to go somewhere else, and there were a number of options. But I don't think we will get to that point. Now, with Ukraine, uh, it's, uh, it's, ra it's, it's rather simpler. Uh, we are preparing for the counteroffensive. Uh, we clearly agnostic about the direction, uh, because uh, this direction will be determined when the intelligence 
on that point of time will tell us where the Russians are less prepared, the, the, the least prepared for the for, for that offensive, because Crimea, uh, sorry, uh, Kharkiv, uh, which Ed described, uh, was clearly uh, an opportunity-based uh, plan. Uh, Russians completely forgot about uh, Kharkiv. They, they 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 sort of didn't include it's in in the planning they were concentrating on uh, on the east most of all then we started the uh, preparations for the counteroffensive in Kherson they started to in some sort of panic throw the uh, forces to Kherson um and we we uh, we started offensive in Kharkiv so basically the uh, clearly they don't have officers and they don't have a high rank officers they don't have a junior officers of uh enough to hold that long front line that's that's a fact so they lost a lot of officers during this war, and they didn't have a lot from the very beginning, like capable officers. So, so they will not be able to hold the whole front line. Um, and importantly, they also don't have uh, surgeon corps, as we all know. Uh, they still have this NCO uh, doctrine from the Soviet times, which basically uh, they, they're not they're not having them as an essential part of the capability, de defining part of the capability. So uh, everything is, uh, the whole burden of like the running troops is on the officers and uh, they don't have enough. So I think that uh, that length of front line for them is completely un, uh, um, un, 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 unrealistic to hold. And that's why the forecast for them that they will lose a lot of this in the springtime, um, or at least some substantial part of it. Thank you. I mean, thank you. Uh, Richard, did you want to come in on this one? Just very quickly. Uh, Andre, we hear uh, not often that the Donbass is full of precious metals. I mean, it's rich in them. What, I mean, Crimea's got the port for the Russians. Donbass, economically, as I understand it, uh, could bear fruit for the Russians economically in the years ahead. Is, is that, how true is that? And what impact or influence will that have on the Russians clinging on to that part of your country? Um, it certainly has lots of uh, resources. Uh, that is true. Donbass originally was developed uh, uh, in, a, in a, like centuries ago, Donbass was always a very scarcely uh, sort of populated area. And it was populated significantly, <laughs> specifically because of the development of, the, of mining and irons. Industry. So there was originally Donbas was built around that industry, all of it. Uh, so yes, uh, there are there are resources, and for sure Russians would try to benefit. At the same time, uh, it's sad to say, but all infrastructure of Donbas, all facilities, all industrial facilities, everything is completely destroyed. I mean, this war had like uh, uh, if you can look, you can Google Marienka, for example, as a as a as a village which is literally doesn't exist anymore. And this is and the the pictures were populated recently. Online and unfortunately, it's one of many settlements in Donbas which which totally destroyed. So I don't think uh, I don't think they have immediate plans of sort of benefiting from the from the from the resources. Uh, they own the port of Mariupol right now temporarily, of course, but nevertheless, which is totally destroyed as well. The city which they which they almost leveled. Uh, Mariupol was the key port for Azov Sea for the transportation of the Donbas ores to the world markets. So uh, they have access to resources, they have access to infrastructure, except that all infrastructure is broken. Um, okay. I, I, I think, to be honest, I mean, the reason they're clinging to Donbass is because uh, they originally had some medium success there back in 2014, when they occupied uh, half of it. And uh, they developed that whole story about the Donbass people, which is artificial in their information space. They developed this whole story about like Donbass being something very specific and something which Russians are defending, which obviously is not the case. Uh, and now they just want to continue that story because uh, in the information space they are failing because all, all their constructs which they were building, they're not holding. Uh, and that's why they need some other story to sell. And uh, I, I believe so that political slash information part of uh, uh, it is the key here so far, at least. Andre, thank you. Jim. Uh, Richard, thanks very much indeed. I just want to now step back and look at the, the entire picture as to where this is going. Uh, we're fond of quoting Sun Tzu on this uh, <laughs> committee. Um, and he wrote, I think, two and a half thousand years ago that the strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory and that tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. We ask successive ministers uh, that come in front of this committee and indeed military leaders, what does victory look like? Indeed, what is our mission there? And it's slid across to say it's for the Ukrainians to decide. 
If I was to say that our mission is to support the people of Ukraine in liberating all of their sovereign territory, including Donbass and Crimea, and to help build the long-term security framework that can stand up to any Russian aggression in the future, would you agree that that would be a sound uh, strategy? Uh, the question, I presume, is to me, correct? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, absolutely clear plan, and that plan involves uh, liberation of 100% of our territory. And this is not because we're opportunistic and it's not because we are vengeful. It's because we uh, clearly understand that unless this is done, the danger and the threat will stay with us forever. So we so need wh to... Why, can I ask, is Jan Stoltenberg and indeed every other leader, including the United States President, hesitant to join in in supporting with that clear mission statement? I believe that uh, because it's a difficult job, and I believe because it's uh, it's tough to calculate up front, and that's why lots of uh, leaders are uh, careful when they endorse. However, we see a lot of statements about the victory, uh, and uh, we do assume that it may come with stages, and we do assume that it's not going to happen alone in one day. Yeah. At the same time, uh, I believe that uh, the only hesitation, the only hesitation which any of those leaders have is that uh, it's, a, it's a difficult job militarily because Russian have still substantial forces there. They still have yeah. substantial amount of weapons, including in Crimea and so on. But uh, if we are uh, discouraged by a diffi difficulty, we wouldn't be able to even start because originally, if you remember a year ago, uh, the consensus of majority of the politicians in the West and all analysts pretty much in the West was that Ukraine would, go, would fail very quickly, which didn't happen. So we are used to work against the odds, and we will we will do this uh, we will do this in the future. Um, there is no other hesitation except that uh, military uh, toughness of the of that challenge. That that's the only one. Okay, thank you for that, Ed. 2023 could therefore be a pivotal year because if we're saying that is the mission to liberate the entirety of Ukraine, that requires uh, Ukraine to move very much onto the offensive rather than defensive punch through the defensive lines of Russia, which is why they've asked for tanks, requiring air power as well. If they're not seen to gain terrain, this ends up as a frozen conflict. Mm. So should this not then provide clarity as to the urgency for the equipment that we actually need to give to Ukraine so they can complete uh, their mission this year? Yes, and I think there is a level of urgency. I mean, slightly back to your previous point, I mean, I, I didn't fully write down your full mission statement, but I think it's important that the second half of it, it's the long term, you know, everyone is who's supporting Ukraine at the moment and Ukraine fighting, um, you know, almost a fight for national survival. I mean, if we were then not to provide that long term support, so Ukraine has the terror. Well, I described the a security framework to support yeah, Ukraine. But it's the future defense and det <laughs> well, deterrence by denial to make it basically that no other Russian leader would attempt what they have done in, say, a five to 10, 15 year time frame. I think that's really important. And yes, there's an element of urgency, but also back again to the Secretary General's point that you made. I mean, this Secretary General's job in NATO is to build consensus. NATO is a consensus organization that might have to move slower than we would like, but it's, you know, if you don't have that consensus and there are splits earlier to the point on, on unity, I think that's pretty difficult. The other aspect of this is we do need to manage escalation. And again, the, that is on the shoulders of the Secretary General a lot as the main spokesperson for NATO. So I think managing those two things it's very difficult to get such a clear articulation of the mission statements at this present time. But we're seeing Russia actually take an interest not just in Ukraine, but in the Slavic uh, footprint of uh, Europe. Therefore, this is, doesn't end with Ukraine. This is a, a, a new era of insecurity where Russia is the aggressor. There's a deficit between our uh, security uh, envelope and indeed our democratic map. And that gap is essentially what Russia is after. So the limitations of what NATO can do has actually been exposed by Ukraine. One of the first sentences that came out was, NATO cannot formally get involved. It's not a NATO member in Ukraine. Yes, and I think Russia is sort of seeking to exploit those potential fault lines. But again, to an earlier answer, it's, it's not just NATO. 
you know, the, NATO is the primary security provider within Europe, and especially it's a coalition of willing that's really stepped forward, isn't it? it that, that partly, it's really and and also another a grouping. So, you know, Joint Expeditionary Force has, you know, its activity has increased significantly. The you know three leaders meetings. Uh, I think the first one was. Uh, the day after the invasion, um, you know, the UK Tallinn pledge on the 19th were partly by uh, Jeff member states, but also Central and Eastern European. You know, there's a lot of political change going on in Europe at this current time. You know, Warsaw is stepping up as one of you know regional actor that um, it wouldn't have been considered prior to this invasion, and also going with that is you know in increases in defence spending. I think 25 of the th uh, current 30 members of NATO have already committed to increased defence spending. So there's a lot of changes as well. And within that, again, going back to the consensus point, that it's very difficult to manage all of that, not just at the multilateral level, but also the minilateral, bi and trilateral level. Okay. It goes quite slowly, but also I think probably, you know, impressively quickly for an organisation such as NATO. Thank you. And just finally, Andre, NATO clearly is is where ukraine wants to end up but as an interim stage perhaps the joint expeditionary force would be that forward-leaning organization far more flexible far more engaging uh, without the limitations without the consensus uh, that holds back nato do you, would you like to see ukraine being invited perhaps with poland to join the joint expeditionary force i would welcome every form of collaboration with nato so absolutely, we shouldn't be staying away from uh, any NATO project suggested, because uh, as far as we go, we we can we can contribute to a lot of uh, NATO programs. I'm sure we're probably one of the most experienced, if not the most experienced, army in the world at the moment. Uh, we can be fighting with the uh, with the very different conflict which most of NATO uh, armies had, and uh, against a very sophisticated enemy. <coughs> And so, yes, we can contribute to NATO as much as NATO can contribute to us. Um, meanwhile, while politically it's been decided, and uh, we perhaps could also talk about membership action plan, uh, even in a, on a general terms. But while this is happening, I would support any NATO integration, any, any NATO project, personally. Okay. My question personally. was specific to the Joint Expeditionary Force. Are Absolutely, we yes. You'd agree with that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Let's now thank turn you. to back to the tactics. Uh, Mark, Francois. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ed, I think Rusi produced an analysis recently on the first three months of the war. And from memory, one of the points, it was a very good report, was that they estimated that Russia in two days fired off the equivalent of the British Army's entire artillery ammunition stocks. I don't know how they got that figure, but that was their estimate. So... <coughs> We have lent large amounts of artillery, or given large amounts of artillery ammunition to Ukraine. What should the United Kingdom government and NATO more broadly be doing to address the shortfalls in, wep in our own weapons and ammunition stockpiles which have been exposed by the war in Ukraine? Yeah, um, one point I think it's really important when we talk about military technical assistance to Ukraine that it's not sort of you know, gifting, donating, I see this as an investment, and I think you only have to see from uh, your Estonian point of view as a frontline state that if you look at GDP from military assistance, it comes actually right up on top. So there's there's an element that we are investing in the defence of the Euro Atlantic area by support to Ukraine at the moment. Um, yes, it was a very good report, and it shows that ammunition stockpiles across NATO member states and other European states are wholly insufficient for this type of war fighting. I think there's been quite a, you know, a number of years of false assumptions made about what you know, um, industrial fighting at this scale uh, requires. And I think there's two things at the moment. There's you know, providing the ammunition to Ukraine to be able to achieve its military objectives on the ground, but it's also rebuilding these stockpiles. And apart from the US, there's no one in Europe who is doing particularly well on this front. It's how we go about um, you know, sort of collaborating together. And at the moment, it's a bit of a mixed picture that some, some nations have effectively gone on their own, put in their orders yeah. early as possible because with supply chain issues, a bit of a legacy from COVID that most of these weapon systems that we're talking about, I mean, there's a year to a year and a half um, gap 
between putting the order in. So, for example, on, on Enlaw. So I think we've seen an element of some nations going their on their own. What we are seeing with the EU specifically on ammunition for artillery is that they're starting to get together and look at scaling defence industrial capacity, which, again, what? no... What, no one nation has the ability to do that at this present time. Well, on that point, I mean, I mean, some of us, I think, would argue that in defence, we, we've we've effectively been operating, you know, the ten-year rule of the 1920s unofficially for several years. But you know, maybe that's a, that's a bigger argument for another day. But we've we've certainly not had the war stocks for any kind of protracted major war with Russia. Mm -hmm. I think you know, even the chief of the general staff has in terms acknowledge that. So you, you talk about industrial capability. We've placed, and I'm talking about the UK now, we've placed a small order to replace some of the in-laws that we've given to Ukraine. But our understanding as a committee is, if you like, the substantive order for thousands of them has not yet been placed. Artillery ammunition, BAE systems are our provider for that. They have not yet been given a major contract, even to replace the artillery rounds that we've given to Ukraine, let alone to bolster our war stocks from a couple of days to much longer than that. So in the United Kingdom, is this not now a really pressing necessity? Because if you're going to open up new production lines and start to produce 155 ammunition, for instance, at scale, that requires investment and time to do it. So aren't you disappointed that so far the Ministry of Defence still hasn't done that? I am disappointed and I think you know, there needs to be those demand signals to defence industry to start to scale production, but also this isn't sort of a peak in demand that might level off as well. This is, you know, this is moving to sort of you know, proper war production because on the Russian side that, that is absolutely what their intent is. Yes, there's been delay in some things, so for example, end laws. Um, there have been other successes, so straight after Nord Stream 1 and 2 incident, um, you know, an order for two subservice uh, multi wall ships that can protect uh, underwater critical national infrastructure, and we are committed to also protect our allies' critical national infrastructure in the Defence Command paper in the High North, so it is a slightly mixed picture, but I think where we are in the UK specifically at the moment is a bit of sort of analysis paralysis that the, the process we have decided to go for is an update to the integrated review sort of glo what I mean by that is the document global Britain in a competitive age uh, which is more the international relations side so to look at your Atlantic security versus the Indo-Pacific tilt and only once that is complete we then look at defense command paper issues and then yes. perhaps if we're lucky at the same time defense and security industrial strategy Whereas I believe that we probably had the data, you know, April, May last year to understand, you know, we need to replenish the stocks that we have. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need to yeah. save time because we've got a very important statement in the House very shortly. Mm -hmm. So, so you characterised as paralysis by analysis, and I think that's probably right. So, so our understanding from industry is they've been, you know, they've been asked for all sorts of quotes for what they could theoretically do but no major orders, no substantive orders have been placed. So would you agree, at the risk of leading the witness here, would you agree that this is something that we really must address in the refresh of the integrated review and in the associated command paper, that we're going to have to find the money from somewhere to, to massively replenish our stocks of weapons, ammunition, artillery, missiles, if we're going to have a credible deterrent effect? Yes, and you know, urgency. I mean, I, I wrote a piece for the Rusi website back in October to essentially make the point that the integrated review shouldn't be touched. We should just go straight into a very programmatic um, review of the Defence Command paper because we now have data on how Russia fights, which for mm. the last 30 years, no European, you know, whether it be NATO, EU structure, ever actually understood exactly how Russians fight and we obviously overestimated it. So I think we are certainly a couple of months behind where I think we should be. But also, you know, this is quite complicated and I just point to the example of Germany. You know, the 100 billion special fund that was set up on the 27th of February, we're still not actually seeing many orders from that, if at all, coming through the system. Now, there's other procurement issues, well, but when you're talking about the scale that. of this... We went this to Berlin and we asked the question, how quickly, of the air MOD, are you going to spend this money? 
they said we might spend it over four years or we might spend it over seven or we might spend it over ten. So as soon as you say to a bunch of, that to a bunch of politicians, we go, ah, so you mean 10 billion euros a year for 10 years? And when we spoke to the German defence industry the following day, they couldn't have been more cynical about how quickly this money was actually going to have been spent. I mean, just to get that on the record. And we're tight for time, but, but, but is there anything you want to add on that from a Ukrainian perspective? We know that you're, um, putting, you're putting this ammunition to good use, but is there anything you want to add? I suggest that we, the, the, our key partners, including UK, have a new in a policy of industrial collaboration with Ukraine. I think that uh, we, are in, we are in a situation when we also need to involve our industry and the industries of the countries which are bordering with us. I think that we need to bring a lot of the a lot of the industrial projects either in uh, in the parts of Ukraine or uh, or close to Ukraine and there's been some good examples I mean there's some been good collaborations uh, particularly you may have heard of Babcock collaboration with Ukraine but uh, it's just the beginning we need we need to do more we need to uh, for example we can do all many parts at home uh, in Ukraine and save on logistics and actually close that logistic gap completely we can do some simple, uh, relatively simple to start with some uh, weapons or some uh, some auxiliary equipment, etc. And I think that in this case, uh, we may debottleneck a lot of the processes, uh, but that would require a new vision and a new sort of collaboration policy. So I would suggest to do, to look at that significantly, substantially. Thank you very much, Chair. Well, thanks very much uh, indeed. Dave. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> um, Ed, the budget will, uh, the upcoming budget will determine where defence goes from here uh, with the allocation to, to MOD. The, we've learned a lot in the United Kingdom's support for Ukraine, um, and we've learned how quickly uh, stockpiles have burned down and how capabilities that we thought were uh, robust and enduring are actually uh, insufficient and fragile. And I wonder what your assessment is, and of course this doesn't just affect the United Kingdom, this has been an issue for um, allied nations within NATO, notably not including the United States to the same scale, but of course everything's relative. They've had, um, if you're sending an awful lot more than uh, everybody else like the United States is, even they're uh, having to resupply in a hurry uh, from a supply chain which has atrophied to a greater or lesser um, extent. But in purely in terms of the United Kingdom, Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't the Secretary of State be concerned that we may, in fact, be in possession, with no disrespect to men and women in uniform, purely in equipment terms, of something akin to an ornamental armed forces, insofar as it certainly looks the part. We've got all the top flight equipment. We don't have enough of it. We can't resource it in time of need. Uh, and when push comes to shove, it proves to be lesser or uh, not certainly to the same extent providing the capability that we anticipated it would. Is that something that we should be really concerned about in defence in the United Kingdom? Yes, I think we should, and sort of highlight the you know, NATO's uh, strategic concept, you know, to defend every inch of allied territory. That is a substantive change from the previous direction. And the NATO defence planning process, which is a four-year process, which I believe it's next year, which it starts its new cycle, will be one of the drivers for that. But specifically with the UK, back to one of my previous points, I think there's an element of, you know, there's a cultural element around this. For a long time, we have gone for exquisite capabilities. Mm -hmm. We've also looked at... Um, platforms, etc., and then decided to put additional requirements on. And obviously, Ajax is one issue where that has not gone well. What the lessons coming out of Ukraine has actually shown, especially in terms of unmanned aerial systems, that you know these don't have to be the best. And you know, for example, with Poland, I mean, they're going. Um, you know, it's the only um, South Korean K2 tank. You know. From a top Trump's perspective, it's not as good as a leopard, but you've got a thousand of them, and they're available now. So I think you know there's a cultural element within mm. the UK that we need to change, and also I think it also you know you're right in terms of credibility. I mean we've been talking about a war fighting division for a long time, uh, future soldier by 2030. You know, go back to 2015 SDSR, which was Joint Force 2025. You know, we were supposed to have a war fighting division ready by 2025 with an air group and a maritime group. And bearing in mind the um, security situation, that looks pretty good about now. But the other thing is it has to be credible and credibility in the eyes of adversaries for deterrence, but also credible to allies. 
So could we put a division in the field now, which the Baltics have requested? Possibly. But is it credible? Perhaps not. And that's the real issue. And that goes back to readiness issues, which, as you rightly highlight, you're European and, and US as well. Because <coughs> this is not just an underinvestment phase. I think it's also that we have been doing you know, <coughs> discretionary expeditionary operations for a long time, and that has bent us out of shape. And in terms of those decisions, I'd, I'd, I'd list a couple of examples. Um, it's new frigates being fitted for but not with complex systems and uh, an order for E7 wedge tails mm. reduced to three, which some people, some professionals, would regard as being so low as to be pointless. Isn't, is that part of the exquisite culture, which we have to have these things, but we can't actually fund we can't actually fund them to do the job that we require them to do, but we still need to tick the box. Possibly, but actually I think the, tick, the box ticking is more of an issue within NATO internal processes. So NATO defence planning process favours land forces and heavy land forces, mm. which we just do not have at the moment. But we have a lot of exquisite capabilities which are really important, which can be deployed in areas such as Northern Europe, which our allies are really supportive of. And also capabilities that we can get together with allies. So, for example, uh, P-8 Maritime Patrol aircraft. We have a trilateral with the US and Norway to basically provide ISR coverage of that whole area. And that's effectively you know, protecting NATO's one of its flanks and also reinforcement routes. So we make a real... Um, you know, difference and also that our um, nuclear deterrent is under NATO command as well which you know the, the, the French system is not so I think we we certainly spend a lot and in these um, you know exquisite uh, capabilities I think we could do a bit of a better messaging and communications about all of those things so that we can sort of marry up that discrepancy by this fact that you know the one process says I want a heavy you know, brigade or division, and we say, well, we've got an aircraft carrier. You know, those two things don't quite marry up at the moment. Okay, thank you. We had two supplementaries, uh, Kevin and then Derek. I've got to say, uh, Ed, I agree your skepticism about the ability to deploy a brigade. You're running out of road. Isn't it time that actually what needs to happen, especially with the Army and the MOD, is that looking at the new... I'm, I'm going to nip NATO off your back. Oh, I'm We're tag team here. We actually try and form our... Uh, future procurement and uh, lay down in terms of particular around fitting into that new new concept rather than actually keep keep going on saying that somehow like a virility symbol that we've got we can uh, a division when in in effect we can't got five Yes, and I, th I think the issue with the, the you know the war fighting division, sovereign war fighting division as well, that it's become sort of a, you know an aspirational target that we've also signalled primarily to the US as well. So not just within the NATO context, but also to our NATO allies. So in sort of talking about it for so long, we've sort of got wrapped up in the fact that that is exactly what we need to deliver. So you know that's by 2030, but to provide a you know UK led war fighting division with perhaps a brigade from a joint expeditionary force member next year or by 2025 I would ar argue is also good enough I think there's an element where we don't ever want to sort of acknowledge that we have to go below the sort of divisional level and also you know again future soldier with our brigade combat teams you know there's a reason we call them brigade combat teams it's to plug into US constructs as well so there's other options that we we can go for again if we sort of slightly change the mindset about it but a US led sorry a UK led division with other assets from European nations would obviously be welcomed by US and Europe Okay, uh, Derek. So you can just pursue that in one second, because um, uh, I noticed you keep using the word UK led and uh, other assets. Um, is it your view? Could, could we today, could the UK today, um, actually put out a UK fighting division? Could it? Could it do it today? Um, perhaps. I'm not about UK led. I'm I mean, not about other assets from the continent. Can, can we do it yes. today? To deploy a UK division the UK into the field. Provide a fighting division today. A ten thousand. Is it ten thousand strong? I think we could get the numbers of personnel, but in order to do that, you'd have to draw from sixteen air assault and also uh, three. Command
Commando Brigade, so it leaves you with no contingent capability to do something, for example, like Operation Pitting. I think from a logistics point, we would struggle, and also from a vehicle position, not just in terms of mm. armour of a variety, um, sorry, and also not just tanks, sorry, armoured personnel carriers, but also the logistics support to that, we would struggle. Again, it's the credibility in the eyes of adversary and allies. I'm sorry to jump in, but just would you agree the word perhaps does not have a very strong deterrent effect? Yeah, and that, that's my point on cred that's my point on credibility. So to put this into context, the reason why the question is important is because NATO have increased this the size of its rapid response force from forty thousand, which we could make a major contribution, you touched on sixty year assault brigade, three commander brigade, for example, up to three hundred thousand. And we're still pressing you know, the MOD for an answer as to what our contribution would be, given that the uh, Secretary General of NATO clearly believes the threat has increased, therefore response needs to be larger, what would Britain do? So, I mean, again, the, the increase of the NATO response force, I mean, it, again, it is very ambitious, and those 300,000 are to be held at very different high, uh, levels of readiness, same as the current NATO response force of 40,000, but they're also more geographically focused. So, for example, um, you know, we currently have Estonia as our um, multinational battle group. We did have an uplift of two battle groups, um, but we've now withdrawn one, which again, I, I, optically, I don't don't think looks good. We um, agreed with Germany that we would put uh, sort of skeleton brigade, um, brigade headquarters in our multinational battle groups to scale up to that level if required, and the. Um, you know, Estonia and Lithuania are happy with that sort of arrangement for now, but I think you're right. I mean, they did ask for divisions, and we deployed two battle groups. If, yes, uh, just sticking with armour, uh, I think, Ed, you talked earlier about your ambitions and or frustrations with a failure to purchase commonality across European NATO allies. I assume Challenger 3 would fall foul of your ambition for people to uh, have common, or for NATO allies to have commonality. For instance, that would presumably be ideally be, uh, be, be Leopard 2. Yes, in terms of availability. So I think, and again, this is a personal opinion, I was always in favour of U European joint procurement, again, because of the reasons that we're seeing in terms of support to Ukraine, but also as economic conditions worsen, then the um, you know, the benefits of collaboration are you know significant, and I think being back to my cultural point, we we tend to look at things. Yes, we need sovereign capability for a variety of reasons, but we also seem to put a lot of additional requirements on um, kit and equipment, which is poor from a NATO standardisation process. And I think NATO is now at the level where they're going to really try and incentivise not just economically, but also other methods of incentivization to really try and pool these parts around certain areas of kit because, you know, the interoperability advantages that they, they get are significant. And also beyond the procurement horizon, the upgrading of that equipment is shared on Leopard 2 across, what, I don't know, a couple of dozen nations, whereas the upgrading and improvement burden for Challenger 3 falls on one nation, the United Kingdom. Yes, which, well, from the news as well, is, is currently ahead of schedule, which is okay. advantageous. We had one more quick technical question, I think. Thanks, uh, Chair. I want to return to the point I asked you to consider earlier about the air mobility force uh, and C-130, um, because clearly you made the point earlier about the ability to move kit and how important that is at a strategic and tactical level. Um, and the question I'd just like to ask you about is a comment on the mass availability that we have. I mean, it seems to me that if you look at the heavy tasking of the air mobility force it. overall, and particularly C-130, J Hercules, and um, that the absence of that fleet is simply mean we'll be relying behind the scenes on US backfill, won't we? Yeah. Yes, and I think, I mean, important to note as well, although the main driver of the uh, refresh of the integrated review is the war in Ukraine, there is also, you know, the, the process started with the fall of Kabul as well, yeah. so the C-130, um, you know, hopefully is in that question, I mean, but it's, it's a wider European issue that Apart from the US, the 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 U, um, sorry, Europe really lacks strategic lift and air-to-air -air refueling so capabilities. So if you look at French and European operations in the cell under Bahane and uh, Tukuba, 
you know, the things that they needed from the US, apart from just ISR and intelligence support, was strategic lift and air-to-air refueling, because we can't do it. They are really, really expensive, and they sort of, you know, they're enablers, they're not the really shiny sort of front-line equipment, but it's something that the Europeans are now going to have to get around and say, well, it's not good enough to have to rely on the US for all of this, because yes, the US, you know, to reinforce Europe need all of this, but they also have other priorities around the globe, so I think it would be very foolish to just to rely on US capabilities in this regard. Okay, thank you. Final question. I'm conscious there's a statement that people want to, colleagues want to get to, but if I may, Andre, just to conclude, are we really taking this seriously enough? There's great grand statements of support for Ukraine, but it's taken us a year to get main battle tanks to you. There's still political questions over air power, yet I think we kid ourselves about us uh, being able to push Russia back in a a time frame, bearing in mind they do have ability to learn and they do have an ability to endure hardship far greater than the West and to test our patience, our commitment as, as well. Do you think the West really is, is awake to the, the, the <coughs> sense of urgency that uh, is, is now required to conclude this before perhaps Western morale, Western uh, collegiate support starts to, to unravel? Thank you. First of all, uh, yes, the West took it seriously. We received uh, equipment and weapons for billions, tens of billions of, of, uh, of in any currency. So yes, I mean, we that support was absolutely crucial. Uh, the 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 only issue is that we constantly see a lot of doubts of many from many politicians about where it goes, how the end game looks like. Um, you know whether we are looking going for for what type of scenario we're going, etc. And those doubts sometimes self self defer uh, politicians from making some decisions. And yes, indeed, we, the the decisions on tanks, decisions on some other weapons could have been done earlier. That's that's a fact as well. And we believe that we we currently delaying the uh, uh, some decisions which would be you know, critical. So. Uh, also, the, uh, there's con constant discussions of the uh, uh, scenarios of escalations, and many of those are no longer relevant, but they're still deterring the, uh, uh, de de deterring the, or at least delaying the decisions. So I believe that we could we could we could be more result uh, collectively about this. And uh, indeed, there's a lot of constant noise about like some scenarios which are completely unrealistic. For example, when Ukraine is going to negotiate. Uh, and it happens. It, it storms the press and the information space with, uh, with, and and I believe that it confuses the matter because Putin is clearly not about negotiations whatsoever. He's clearly after after do whatever he can in order to destroy Ukraine and uh, uh, whatever the scenario. But the resistance is our only option, which we're pursuing. So that's uh, that's why we would welcome um, we would welcome uh, co further collaboration, further support. We believe we can win absolutely. We believe mathematically we have uh, we have uh, very good chances right now. We know how to do that. Um, if I may remind that uh, in 1940 Churchill spoke in the EU Parliament and he talked about victory without mathematical chances like we have now. Uh, we have much better chances that UK had at, at that time, and you were resolved completely to win. We resolved absolutely. Yeah. So that's why let's just let's just do it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Andre. Ed, any final words? Not for me. I think that was a okay. good summary by Andre. Andre, Ed, thank you very much indeed for such an informative session. And uh, it only goes to say that our thoughts and prayers are with all the people of Ukraine during this very, very difficult time, not least yeah. in what's going to happen in the next yeah. few months. And we will do our utmost to make sure that we can provide all the necessary support that you require, as I hope we've illustrated during this uh, committee session here. Thank you very much indeed to you thank both. You. Thank you to uh, my committee members and to the staff. That brings to this uh, this conclusion to this se session. Order, order. Thank you.